So not only was he sleeping in poop for an hour or more, then he gets woke up, or he wakes up, and instead of getting to go right back to sleep like he wants, I'm scraping on his butt with a wipe trying to get it all off, and he just, leave me alone! You're still recording, so that's just horrible. <laughs> Thank you for listening. That gets my goat. So big, I this isn't one of those things I want to complain about, but it is still a that gets my goat. Okay, should we do a welcome real quick before we get that far? Yes. All right. Hey everybody, welcome. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And this is That Gets My Goat. That's right. And something that I wanted to talk to you about. But uh, I asked you earlier if you knew anything about this and, and you didn't. But I wanted to talk about the Veronica Mars movie. Have you ever watched – are you familiar with the TV show Veronica Mars? Only vaguely. I think my wife actually used to watch it. I know it was Kristen – it's Kristen Stewart, right? No, Kristen Stewart is the girl incapable of smiling. Oh, Kristen Bell is Kristen the, Bell. There, okay. there are a lot of Kristens, I'll admit. There are. But basically, this was a show that ran on UPN – from 2004 to 2006, uh, then UPN died, and it got picked up on the CW network from 2006 to 2007, and it was never a very successful show. It always had pretty low ratings uh, and was in danger of cancellation the first year and the second year, and then it was canceled the third year. But it had a tremendous cult fan following, and then it also had... Unlike Firefly, friends at the network who really liked the show and were willing to, uh, you know, risk it a little bit. Yes, they were. They were passionate enough to say, "Well, this show's not super high in the ratings, but uh, we'll continue to give it a, uh, a a try because we really like the show." Okay. Um, anyway, that's beside the point. I never watched the show. I wasn't really familiar with the show, but my friend Jeff. Oh, he he loved it. I, I, he loved uh, Kristen Bell, who played Veronica Mars. He still loves Kristen Bell. And uh, being the kind of guy that he is, he's one of those proselyting fans. If there's a show that he likes, he tries to get everybody he knows to like it, too. And, and he would lend out the box set to everybody. And, and I was that way, definitely, with Firefly, where I would buy people Firefly for Christmas or things like that. and. Uh, Basically, it was a drama, mystery, teen angst show, kind of like a Nancy Drew meets Dawson's Creek kind of show. Uh huh. See, that's why my wife loved it. Anything that has mystery involved in it, she's down. I mean, she is a big fan of Matlock and Murder, she wrote, because they were mysteries. She's that into mysteries, apparently. And she's in her late seventies too, so you know it's it's perfect. <laughs> That's the weird thing is that she's not, and yet she still actually likes those shows. So that just shows you how much mysteries are her thing. And she did also watch Veronica Mars when it was on, or later. Uh, I believe it was still on when she watched it, but ne she never tried to force you to watch it. She didn't love the show. Like, uh, you know, I think she only was able to pick it up in the last season, and. She she, if it had continued, she may have tried to force me. She would have grabbed me by the scruff of my neck and just held my face in front of the TV. Watch this! Watch it! Okay. Don't you look away! <laughs> Don't blink! Stop that! I believe that's how your last child was conceived at the same <laughs> time. Yeah, if she hadn't watched it, I think I would have said, oh, you should sit down and watch that with her, because I think she would dig it. Probably more than you would dig it. But one of the things that was really clever about the show was that each episode had a, a little mystery. Somebody would come to Veronica with a problem and she would have to solve it. But there was an overarching mystery for the whole season. Uh, so you might say that Veronica's, you know, her, her abiding principle was, if you've got a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Check out the hook while the DJ revolted. Is that the <laughs> next line? I think so, yeah. <laughs> you know, I still like that song. <laughs> so it, w it was a serialized show. And in the end, in a, a desperate 
bid to get ratings, they they didn't serialize. They they said, okay, well, we're going to do standalone episodes and see if that saves the show, and it didn't. But after the show was canceled, this creator of the show, Rob Thomas, and he's not the Rob Thomas, but he's a Rob Thomas. He's still smooth, though. Well, I don't know. He <laughs> shot, uh, not a pilot, but he shot like a what they call a sizzle reel in the industry. One of those nasty industry terms that I wish I didn't know, but like a phony trailer for what the fourth season of Veronica Mars would be. And he, he glitzed it up and Veronica Mars like three years in the future or five years in the future was a rookie in the FBI. And he put that out there as like, you know, Hey, here's where it could go. You guys didn't like where I was doing with it. Try this. And, and that went nowhere. And then after that, he, came up with a movie idea for Veronica Mars, the movie. And he wrote a script and talked about it and tried to get Warner Brothers to uh, fund that. And they wouldn't. They just didn't see the uh, the dollar sign in it, the, the, the money in it. And fast forward to, geez, almost a decade later, it's uh, 2013. He went back to Warner Brothers with the script and, and and the idea of doing a Kickstarter fund. And you and I have talked about Kickstarters. We even tried to do one ourselves, but it was <laughs> too complicated. It was more than what was worth it for what we were going for. Oh, yeah. Good point. I mean, we only wanted like $30. And yeah, Kickstarter is great if you've got a $20,000 project or something, right? Yeah, or even $1,000, but 40 bucks was just silly. Well, maybe in the future for Dune Steef, the motion picture will... Uh... There you go. Anyhow, he, he went to Warner Brothers and said, what if I got the money through Kickstarter? What if I raised it through the fans of Veronica Mars? Would you do it then? And he, as far as I know... It, now, by the way, I, my crap top died, and so I don't have any information in front of me. Normally, I would have like the, the Wikipedia page up and the, the exact stats and all that, but I had to shut it down so that I could record this conversation with you. Mm -hmm. Although, hey, if you want to donate to the show, maybe I could buy a whatever a step up from a crap top would be. Maybe a, a laptop. Whoa, whoa. Which that's would be a, a first. little much, sir. But uh, he went to the Warner's execs and said, if I raise the money myself, what do you think then? And some executive said, if you raise $2 million, you know, and all your little buddies from Veronica Mars will do the movie for free, then we will distribute it. We will uh, do all the stuff that we do for a real movie and you can go. And so on March 13th, 2013, they started this Kickstarter project and basically uh, the Ro A. Rob Thomas – put an open letter and there was a letter from Kristen Bell and they did a little video uh, presentation, a wacky little fun home video kind of thing in, with the people that were on the show talking about, you know, their excitement of the possibility of getting back together. And, and their, their goal was $2 million in 30 days. And they would just put out to the fans, you know, donate what you can. And there are incentives for each level of, of donation that you contribute. Yeah, you know how Kickstarters work as well as anybody, right? Mm-hmm. So if you donated, I don't know, two hundred dollars or whatever, you would get an autographed poster from the cast or something like that. I, I, I don't know, right? And uh, ten hours later, they had already reached their two million dollars. So it's a thirty-day fundraising project, and we're like a, almost a week into it. The night that I'm, we're recording this, and they have. $3,670,690 when I had to shut Firefox down. So, so well beyond their goal in a week. And they said, that, okay, that we'll shoot the movie this summer. You know, everybody has set aside time that we'll make the movie and Warner Brothers will distribute it in early 2014. And everybody that donates over a certain amount will get a copy of the DVD. And it looks like it's going to happen. And it really lit everybody's imagination up in Hollywood that this happened so fast and so big. You know, it was the biggest crowdfunding film project yet. And, you know, it's not even done right. yet. So, I mean, they could have four million. They could have five million. Who knows what they'll have by the end. If they got five million, they could put in some awesome special effects then. <laughs> A whole bunch of CG. 
it's funny because he did it in the the open letter to the fans. You know, he talked about what he could do with two million dollars. But if we had three million dollars, we might have a, a you know a crowd of extras. And he's like, you know, if if we had more, we'd shoot a scene in space. And you know, just being <laughs> uh, snarky about it. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to talk to you about it because people are in Hollywood are saying, oh well, what's next? How, how is this? A sign of things to come? Is this how movies are going to get funded from now on? You know, are the are the studios uh, nervous about this? So I wanted to talk to you about what you think. And then... Uh, well, it's uh, really interesting. Uh, I remember when you mentioned this to me the first time on the phone as we were getting ready for this, you were saying that everybody was just like, oh, oh, has, does Joss Whedon know about this? Somebody g- send him an email. Get, get him... <laughs> I'm trying to figure out some way to... Uh, Get his properties that have been languishing forever to go from languishing to greenlit. It seems like certain people have that kind of problem, but then other people don't. It would be cool to be able to donate to, say, another Firefly movie. But yeah, is it a good thing? Well, for fans of Veronica Mars, it's got to be a good thing. They've got to be really, really happy and they have to say... You know, we made this happen. I had a part of this. When Star Trek was canceled in 1968 and fans wrote letters to Paramount demanding the show come back and it got renewed, you know, I think that was the first time that had ever happened, that fans pushed for a show to get uncanceled and it was uncanceled. So, you know, they can all feel like, wow, that third season of Star Trek is ours, is because of us. And I think the same thing with this. My friend Jeff... He he donated, of course, and he is really, really excited and, and uh, you know, saying, oh, this – and I'm sure it's going to sell well enough that they'll do a sequel and, wow, we're going to have a series of Veronica Mars movies every other year like Bond movies. And because I don't love the show like he does, I'm not as excited. But, yeah, if this were a, okay, we need to fund a feature-length Dr. Horrible movie, hmm. I would be in in a second. Yeah. And if it was, yeah, we'd like to do a TV movie – Firefly, and we'd like to do one every year, I would be all over that. Yeah. And I'm sure there are many, many filmmakers, uh, there already have been, of people who want their short films funded or their documentaries funded or whatever, but people who have, uh, what do you call it, intellectual properties or something that that already have a following are probably lining up to get these things started right now. You know, maybe uh, Chris Carter is wanting there to be a third X-Files movie and see if the fans will pay for it. Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting. But yeah, I mean, there's the drawback to it where people who fund movies, you know, they put their money into it and they get, you know, they get their money plus something back for doing it you know funding movies tends to be an investment it's like buying a stock or something you know you get your money i don't know how many donations they got for veronica mars you know to get their two million dollars was there some really awesome dude who actually yeah i'll throw in a million you know somebody who's rich and just happened to be a big fan or i you know i don't know but i it was over a hundred thousand donations when i looked Uh uh-huh I just it just makes me wonder if they were all relatively small. You know, if they're all relatively small donations, then I don't feel bad for any of those people, you know what I mean? They they're spending their money on what they love kind of a thing and they're getting I'm mean, just getting a move. For me, if I was to donate 100 bucks to Firefly getting made as a movie again or yeah, you know, like your TV movie or whatever or a Doctor Horrible movie, something like that, I would feel it was worth it. If it actually, if, you know, it caused uh, there to be a movie, I would feel it was totally worth it. But it's like you said to me before, you know, you paid all this money and then what you get for your trouble is to buy a ticket to this movie. (laughs) You get to get in line and buy a ticket. I mean, you get to spend more money so you can see it. Well, I I was being the devil's advocate there. There has already been some backlash People saying, oh, where is this going to lead? Because Warner Brothers owns Veronica Mars, and the money that is made for this movie, I imagine, goes to Warner Brothers. Right. You know what I mean? They didn't even believe in it. Uh, Now, granted, I'm sure Rob Thomas and those guys, they'll recoup something. 
because they're probably co-owners or co, well, I don't know, investors, producers, something, but it's a Warner Brothers property. And again, if Warner Brothers doesn't do a very good job and they release it in 30 theaters and just say, well, there, that's it, then they'll be able to say, well, look what kind of money it made for us and, and, and let's not do that in the future. Or if it makes millions on video, you know, there's a possibility that some of those stars will never make that money back because of creative accounting and, and all that happy crappy that goes on in Hollywood. Right. Um, and and then also other people have been complaining about well, yeah, the the studios, what if they they catch on to the idea that if we let people know of a project that we're considering green lighting, they might pay for it for us. It's like we want to do a Jurassic Park four, but we just yeah, we need fifty million dollars to do it. I, we we just can't justify it. But if you folks put in a little bit of money in, and, and suddenly their movie is paid for by the fans, and they're saying, well, it's a slippery slope. Who knows what's going to happen? And uh, as far as Joss Whedon goes, uh, somebody somewhere, one of these same pundits said, you think Whedon can't afford to make another Dr. Horrible or even a full length feature Firefly flick with the money he made from Avengers? And I thought about it and, you know, Kevin Smith is the guy that I always talk about because he's so open with – on his podcast and stuff of, of what kind of money he makes and what he does. And he said he made $6 million for directing Cop Out. And I was just like, you friggin' kidding me? <laughs> Kevin Smith did? I mean, because, uh, dude, $6 million, you and me splitting $6 million, we'd never have to work again in our <laughs> lives. And – so if you think that Kevin made that for Cop Out, what must Joss Whedon have made for The Avengers? You know, a movie that made $1.5 billion. And so, you know, they were saying, yeah, this guy could make this mon these movies himself if he wanted to. But no, you know, you don't do that. You, you, you have the studios pay for it or to have the fans pay for it is just – it's gauche to use that word maybe incorrectly. Quite. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's possible that a couple of these folks, these millionaires, plead poverty and say, hey, you know, we really need you fans to, to fit the bill for this. And uh, and that way there's no I, – I, I, I don't know. I mean, see, it's it, – because there's only been the one example, it's hard for me to say that there's definitely a dark side to all this. Uh-huh. Because – you know, in a perfect world, it's like, well, hey, who cares what the studios want? You know, you guys wanted that Deadpool movie and Fox doesn't believe in it. They only care about Deadpool so that Marvel doesn't get the license. Here, you guys pay for it and we'll make that Deadpool movie for you. You know, that's what my optimistic side is saying. But Fox? Yeah, they'll gladly spend the Deadpool money. <laughs> It's one of those things where... Uh, yeah, I think what really will tell us what's going to happen is when this Veronica Mars movie comes out and it turns out to be successful, will Warner Brothers make another one? Or will they say, oh, well, it wasn't that successful. Maybe if another Kickstarter campaign made us enough money to make it worth making again or something like that. Well, wait, why, why, would they why would they fund a sequel? Right. Wouldn't you just say, hey, this was a great success. You have the fans do it again and we will distribute just the same way. <laughs> and then they light their big Cuban cigars <laughs> and have their uh, rent boys come into the room. <laughs> Sorry, that's that's my experience of Hollywood. I, I, your your experience may vary. I, you know, I don't know. And, and it's possible that this Veronica Mars movie will get made and it'll be something super, super tiny and it's not even a blip on the radar. But there are other people who are saying, you know, this is a monumentous occasion. This is something that's not been done before. And everything is – people are going to remember this moment as something that changed everything afterward where, you know, where the fans began to be able to decide, the, you know, the things that they were passionate about, they could make happen. And, you know, and that's what the beauty of this whole Kickstarter idea is, is if you have a good idea, if you are clever and – a good salesman, 
because frankly, I mean, it's not just cleverness, right? You can be rewarded for that. And, you know, that's the American dream, ostensibly. Be rewarded for being worthwhile? I don't know. The 1%. Well, the American dream was always <laughs> if you worked hard, you would succeed in America. Uh, you know, there are no cats in America. And I, I, I hear this this Kickstarter thing and, and I, you know, I've even considered donating to a couple of them, but I've never done it mostly because, yeah, I don't know, you have to sign up for a an account and put your credit card in and, and I, for some reason that frightened me. Um, it's very scary. I don't know. Have, have you ever donated to one? I don't think so. Um, I first heard about it with the chemo one and it was already over by the time we even looked into it. <laughs> yeah, that, that was too bad. And beyond that, I don't know. I haven't gone looking for it, I guess. Maybe I should. Well, it seems like in your niche of whatever you like, there might be something. You know, I'm sure there are sports, there are clothes, there, you know, there are a film, there are a record, there are book Kickstarters. Mm -hmm. And you want to support the grassroots project, you know, the, the, the little guy, right? the mom and pop video store, the mom and pop grocery store kind of thing. And I, I, I don't know, I, somebody somewhere is going to ruin it for everybody. Uh, a drug dealer is going to do his own Kickstarter thing to make the blue crystal meth from Breaking Bad. And then everybody's going to be like, oh, shoot, Kickstarter's broken now. <laughs> That's possible. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, we tried to freaking do a Kickstarter so that we could go and watch Battleship. So I think it's already broken, man. We broke it. <laughs> no, but we didn't even do it. We didn't create one. Somebody out there wanted me to squirm through Battleship enough to give their money. And and I think that that's the, the, the beauty of this, this idea of the crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, whatever you want to call it, thing – is if you have something that you can get other people excited about, then you don't have to go to the huge corporation and and stand in and sit in the lobby and try to have a meeting with them. And uh, you can appeal to the masses. And and I, I don't know. Someday I would really dig having something that I was passionate about and 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 trying a Kickstarter thing. But yeah, it, I guess it would have to be something more than there's a bad movie on the horizon. And I don't want to see it, but I sort of do. <laughs> Maybe we'll do another one of those for some awful piece of crap this summer. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be several. Uh, I, well, before we go, what are your thoughts on Kickstarter? Uh, uh, I think it's very cool. And th this is a, a pretty good example of just how cool it can be. You can take something which was just dead in the water and turn it around and turn it into something that is going to happen. That's pretty cool. That's pretty special that uh, something like that can be done. It, it makes me think of, you know, the movie that we saw when we went to Comic-Con in 2006 or whatever it was. I think it was called Done the Impossible. Oh, the brown coat movie. Yes, yeah. where the, the, the fans, like the Star Trek fans that you talked about that wrote letters until Star Trek was uncancelled, and like these fans who donated money and caused this Veronica Mars movie to get made... These fans of Firefly, they just, you know, they wouldn't give up on their show and they kept doing things and they kept writing letters and they kept, you know, and they bought DVDs of the show in astonishing numbers and so on and so on until finally somebody said, you know what, this show is worth giving a, a shot and they made a movie and they were able to look at that movie and say, hey, that movie is our movie because it wouldn't have happened without us. That was a, a pretty cool thing, a big achievement, something really special. And uh, Kickstarter can make anything like that happen. You know, if you can conceive it, then maybe it can happen. You know, it all just depends. So I think it's really cool that it exists and that it can be possible. And I'm sure there will come time, maybe, when I try to use it myself, just like you were talking about, and uh, try to find a way that I can uh, crowdsource something. Crowdfund? 
Crowdsource? Crowdsource sounds cool. I, that's it, well, it sounds like crowd surfing, <laughs> which for me is you know just a really neat thing. Is a bunch of strangers holding you up, protecting you from being crowd stomped. They're actually but, just feeling you up if you're a girl, or punching you in the nuts if you're not. Ah, uh, about a decade ago, I think it was 2002. Joss Whedon tried to get a Buffy animated series off the ground. He and jo- uh, Jeff Loeb did this pitch, and they they had a, a like a seven minute demo of what it was going to look like, and and a, a bunch of the people had signed on to do voices, and nobody at Fox would support it because they're like, well, but she's but the name, she's a vampire slayer, and and you know we can't show this during kids' time, and what you want it to sh- show during prime time, and. And yeah, there was just no funding. And I know that uh, they had a bunch of scripts written for this Buffy animated show because for a while there, it looked like it was actually going to happen and then it didn't. It seems like a decade ago, if there had been Kickstarter, we would have seen that Buffy animated series. Yeah, that would be cool. Uh, instead, they just did comic books. And, and and for the fans of the comics, you know, Buffy lives on and it's great stuff and all that. But the animated series would have been something more, something that you could give to your friend and, and have him watch it. And it's a shame that it wasn't around then. Or, or you know, I remember, uh, what's his name? George Takei. Uba. You always wanted there to be a, a Captain Sulu movie before he was too old to do it. And Paramount was like, yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll consider it. But, you know, it just we don't have the money for that sort of thing. And there are a million Star Trek things that might have happened if there had been Kickstarter, you know. The, Ron Moore wanted to do like a Klingon movie that was all about – Wharf on a Klingon bird of prey in the Klingon fleet, you know, just to see what their lives were like. And and Paramount wouldn't do it. And so he sort of reworked it into an episode of Deep Space Nine. And and it's really, really fun. Mm-hmm. But uh, if there had been Kickstarter in the 90s, maybe that would have happened then, too. It's just the possibilities are endless. I, I have no idea how many people are, are gearing up to have their projects go. And the trick will be finding out about these projects that you would really like to support. Right. I guess Twitter and Facebook and all that would be a good way to find them out. But yeah, I had two people email me last week about the Veronica Mars thing um, just to say, oh, have you checked this out? And and so maybe if there was a Star Trek one or if there was a Joss Whedon related one or if there was a – what was the show that your wife got canceled? Pushing Daisies. If there was a Pushing Daisies one, you know, it w- I would hope that we would find out about it. Yeah, that would be cool. I would I would donate for a Pushing Daisies movie. And it seems like just about anybody that was in Pushing Daisies would be down for it. Because they haven't got anything else really going on. Except for maybe Kristen <laughs> Chenoweth. I guess she kind of does this and that all over the place. But <laughs> That's yeah. funny. And yeah, that's the thing with Dr. Horrible. Is I I keep wondering well why doesn't that movie why doesn't that get made and and I yeah I, I suppose when everybody that's in it has their own projects has their own series that are going I don't know yeah do you think that they missed that boat that that ship has sailed I don't know if it has sailed or not it's hard to say it, it, I would think a sequel just a, a little shorty sequel like the original would probably I don't think it has sailed for something like that it might be harder to get a Dr. Horrible movie but I don't know I, it seems like that would be worth it too who would really be ungettable from that group and we don't need Felicia Day anymore because she died oh I hadn't even thought of that oh spoiler alert well, I, I think Neil Patrick Harris is probably the hardest because he's got a TV series that's still going. And then he's got a damn Smurfs movie every summer <laughs> that he shoots. And I, Yeah, and he's got his uh, appearance on the, the latest Harold and Kumar show to, <laughs> to do. Huh. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I think that they could still get him. I think he'd totally be down for it. Something where he could be a musical – I think he'd be willing to give it a shot because, you know, it's like totally his thing. He would love to. Well, I don't know what his off time is like. I mean, maybe he's one of those guys that does a play every summer, too. Yeah, it's possible. But but I don't know. And yeah, the thing with Joss Whedon is now everybody wants to hire him. Yeah. Four years ago, nobody gave a crap about Joss Whedon. And now, you know, he's running 
or at least a big chunk of, of Marvel Studios. And he's got a TV series that he's supposed to be running and, and gearing up for Avengers 2 and overseeing Guardian of the Galaxies and or Guardians of the Galaxy. And, you know, who knows what, what else they've got him trying to do. So. Right. Yeah, he he would be hard now that he's made it big to to get him otherwise. But this is the same guy who shot a whole movie on the weekends when he was editing Avengers. So if he wants to do it, he can do it. True. The problem with Firefly is that he did it. You know what I mean? I, I don't know if he wants to go back. I mean, it's one of those things where, yeah, like I could. I mean, there might be more stuff to tell, but I, I already did that show. And so it's probably not so much of a burning desire or something like that. But I guess in a way you could say the same thing about Dr. Horrible. I mean, he did it. Yeah, I guess you're right. Maybe it's us that, that have unresolved, what do you call it? What, what, why do ghosts stick around? Um, to haunt people. <laughs> right, and to, to watch girls shower. But I mean, that a lot of times they don't move on because they have unresolved issues or, un, you know, something like that. Yeah, right. It, it's got to be weird to be the guy who had to struggle so many times. And, and he had so many projects that almost happened and then they fell through. And now he's the guy that could do anything he wants and has stuff thrown at him all the time. And he's saying no. Yeah, it's got to be pretty weird for him. But a good weird, I would guess. <laughs> All right. Well, that uh, that was a conversation I wanted to have, and we had it, so we can put it behind us. And never speak of it again. No, hell no. I won't even edit it. This Sweet. Just so that, so that I never have to hear it again. Yes, I like it. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yes, this has been Rish Outfield. And Big Anklevich. Your mountain is waiting. So donate on Kickstarter. Or be on your way. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. But it really shouldn't be. Um, I think we have plenty that we could say about it. I mean, all the stuff that you brought up sounds like a lot to be able to talk about. Do you want me to open up the spreadsheet so that we can look at it? Although, I'll have to admit that I haven't written in like three days. We're just talking about our experience so far. Gosh, it's been a long time since I've written, actually. I haven't written since Thursday.